started. Um, so welcome everyone. Hi, my name is Marnie Dow. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. And I serve as the Assistant Director for Student Involvement. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce our guest presenter today, Katie Griffin. Katie currently serves as UNLV's social media strategist. In that role, she plans and implements social media strategies for UNLV's official social media platforms. She directly monitors daily social media efforts that support UNLV's marketing efforts and strategic goals, signature events, initiatives, and brand awareness. Her methods office focus on high levels of engagement with followers. Um, I thought she would be a great presenter for today's session. Um, give you an all a, a perspective of someone who lives in the social media strategy world all day, every day for a large platform. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn the reins over to Katie. It's all yours. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to to chat with you all about social media. Um, again, it's something so important in today's world. And thank you, Marnie, for inviting me um, today. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. If, if at any point you can't, feel free to let me know. Um, also, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I'm happy to go through all of the slides and just talk for an hour. Um, but I always get a lot of value out of having a discussion. So if there's anything um, in particular you have questions on or want to bring up that the slides don't cover, feel free to post that at any time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, today we're going to cover some social media best practices. I'm going to kind of start at the beginning and talk really about uh, determining a social media strategy. Then we'll kind of go into some tips for creating content. And then probably my favorite part and the shortest part is discussing some resources. Um, it's really important if you're managing social media to always be aware of what's going on in the industry. Um, so even more than the presentation today, try to stay up to date is a big piece of advice that I can give you. Um, that way you'll be one of the first to know when Twitter decides to do something silly like add stories to their platform on a Tuesday morning with no notice. So, um, oh, before we jump into, our, I sh I'll give a quick a background of my experience. So I started in higher education about 10 years ago after I graduated from college. I um, started at South Dakota State University as a web writer which um, at the time university websites were really becoming these huge forces and um, the South Dakota State University brought on a couple of writers to work with colleges and departments to do their web presence and from there I kind of transitioned into web development and then later into more of the digital marketing or social media management. Um, I always like to talk about my path to this point just because it underscores one of the main points I have today, which is knowing your audience. And I think without that very first role of really learning about websites and talking to student audiences is how I was able to kind of come into the social media world and have a real audience focused strategy. So let's start with some best practices. So I'm gonna, I have the presentation broke up into kind of three sections. And the first is just going back to the beginning and thinking about your strategy, which is really just defining what your goals are and why you wanna be on social media and who you're talking to. We'll talk a lot about who you're talking to because I just think it's one of the most important things to think about as you're managing social media. Um, this, it's odd being in a virtual format because usually at this point I would kind of like try to get a sense of if the people tuning in, if you're already managing social media content, if you're just thinking about um, getting on social media for your student organization, or if maybe you're just part of the team that's already managing social media content. I created this presentation with the idea um, that you you're still kind of like in that beginning phase of thinking about what to do. 
Um, I think it's really valuable, even if you've already been using social media for yourself or for your organization for a long time to just go back to the beginning and really use that as a way to think about how you can change what you're doing, figure out what works and what doesn't. So that's kind of why we're starting at this point today. So the first step in getting started again is the identifying your goals, what you want to accomplish and who you're talking to. So thinking about your your audience, um, it may not seem very exciting, but it's so, so important. And we'll cover a little bit later why it's so important to know who you're talking to. Because when it's done right, social media can really be used as a community that you may be the organization, but you are part of that community and you want to build it and kind of create this sense of um, togetherness with the people that you're talking to. I really like to talk about that because I think of story of social media and what we do for UNLV social media really as more of storytelling and community building and not as much as marketing. Of course, we always have things like we're always going to need to market UNLV to prospective students and we're always going to need to showcase events and share announcements. Those are just the day to day things that we do. But the big picture is that we're trying to use social media to tell our story of UNLV and how people in our UNLV community and UNLV family can be part of that. And I think that is something that we can all do on student organization, social media, or department and unit social media too. So that's a big, big thing to think about. It's not something that you can even think about once and then just never think about again. It's something you should always be considering with every piece of content you make or every goal that you have in mind is thinking about that community and that audience. And as you're going through that, really like the next natural step is to choose a platform. It's incredibly important to make sure that you're picking those platforms based on where your audience is. Um, we're gonna, in a couple slides here, look at some recent stats on social media because I think that's always fun to see who's using what platform. Um, and then of course the next next thing is posting that content, thinking about um, the content that you want to post and then using some best practices there. So again, that we'll get into that a little bit more later in the presentation. So if you are new to social media, which I think I might have seen one chat message popping through that that was the case. Um, all of this may seem very overwhelming and I think like even me personally social media is a very much of a roller coaster ride between overwhelming and underwhelming sometimes um the best thing i can advise for you is to start small um and again even if you're an experienced or advanced social media user it, it think small think uh, go back to the basics evaluate what you're doing um, social media is constantly changing, and even though some things like your goals or your audience won't change over time, how you reach your goals and how you reach your audience will change with all of the new fe features, with trends, with movements, all of those pieces really play a part into how things can evolve over time. So again, moving kind of down that road as you think about your goals and audiences you're going to want to choose the right platform so really where is your audience um now a recent stat i found is that people have an average of eight different social media accounts doesn't necessarily mean that they're on eight different platforms because people often will have multiple accounts for different platforms for different purposes it's really common these days um but when you hear that, you might initially think like you need to be on all of the platforms since people are using them so differently. But I think what's really cool and interesting about social media users today is that, and I couldn't say this 10 years ago when I started um, in social media, is that people really think about why they're using different platforms personally and what they want to do on them, how they want to connect with people. So you need to have that same thought process for your organization. Um, so one of the big decisions you can make is thinking about what platforms work best for your organization, depending on your audience, as well as the long-term 
plans for your organization. Because if you're just starting out and you're making that decision, you do have to remember that in a few years when you graduate or when things change, you kind of, you want to try to pick a platform that's going to stay the course. That's going to be just as valuable for you in the future as it is today. Um, it can be really hard to predict those things, uh, especially I can say that um, at South Dakota State University, we were maybe not one of the first, but maybe kind of in the first wave of universities that jumped on Snapchat and used it to communicate with students, especially after it evolved from being kind of more of that um, peer to peer photo sharing and they added the stories feature, which I could probably give a whole presentation on the evolution of the stories feature and how that's like really changed the face of social media. Um, but it was it was a kind of a risk to take for higher education back then to get on Snapchat and use it as a way to build a community with your students. And I think it worked really well for a few years. But then as platforms evolved, as Instagram added stories and other platforms kind of went into the disappearing content realm, um, it just didn't make as much sense for a university to be on Snapchat. So that kind of process is pretty natural and pretty common. And so while I do usually advise people not to necessarily just jump on a new platform because it's new or because it's popular and to really think about those long term goals, you can get a lot of value with trying new things. And so it's just something that you kind of have to balance. And again, if you're clear on what your goals are and who your audience is, you can do those all pretty seamlessly. So other things to keep in mind when choosing a platform is just the type of content you prefer to share, what your comfort level is. If you're really great with photography, videography, or writing, if you're gonna be sharing a lot of links and resources, events, all of those features kind of make sense on some platforms more than others. And so you can use those um, content pieces that you think you'll have in the future to make that decision. And then finally, you know, the resources that you or your organization have available, again, um, that can can impact your decision in choosing a platform and long term planning, thinking about, you know, where social media can go, where it's been. Um, and using that to make those decisions. So just kind of to recap those two points as you're setting your goals and evaluating your audiences using those infor using that exercise of doing those things to choose the platform that you're on social media that will that will do wonders for your overall strategy so do we have any questions so far i know i tend to just like jump in and not yet okay. um i'll i'll jump in if when there's a, a break if you think that there's if i think there's a question that needs to get answered but if anyone has questions feel free to add them into the chat as we go and i'll make sure katie gets to them So this is a, a chart um, from, it's pretty recent from Hootsuite, which is a social media management platform. Um, this shows kind of some of the most popular social media platforms, and then the percent of users that kind of are on each platform and how that overlaps with other social media platforms. So I think this is a, like kind of an interesting thing to look at and it offers a little bit of a lesson in knowing your audience, um, especially if you're thinking about um, venturing on to a new platform or maybe you're evaluating if a certain platform is effective for your audience. These stats and numbers like this can be really helpful in seeing just where everybody is sitting in the expanse of social media. And then the next chart here shows, um, based on monthly active users, which platforms are the most popular. This is one of my favorite things to look at um, because I always think it's so interesting how Facebook just seems to overwhelmingly be the top social media platform. And that's based on this daily monthly active users statistic, which may or may not be a good way to evaluate social media platforms. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit later, but numbers can be misleading. And sometimes I do like to make the point that just because a platform like Facebook seems to be really popular in terms of numbers, if that's not where your audience is, it's not going to have that same value for you to be on Facebook. And that's really targeted at anyone. There's really no, um, if maybe you're on Facebook and you feel like you spend a lot of time there and you're just not getting anything out of it, there's really nothing wrong with transitioning to another social media platform. It's all an evolving process. And especially when it comes to um, resources, which are very limited and even like mental resources that go into creating content, it's, it's something to think about is what's working for you. Um, I also always think it's really interesting how Twitter ranks so low in the amount of monthly active users, because I do think like Twitter seems to drive so many conversations and so many pieces of information. Um, I think for a lot of people, again, even though the numbers might not show as many active users, your audience may be particularly active on a platform like Twitter. And that's what we find with UNLV, to be honest, is that that's where we share, we get the most out of sharing events and announcements there because that's where the activity is. So that's a quick primer on the overall social media strategy, things to consider when it comes to goals to your audience. We're gonna talk about audience a lot because it's just so important. Um, so we'll kind of get into the fun part of upping your social media game here in a second because you, again, you need to think about that strategy first. Um, so now that we've covered that, we'll jump into some best practices for content. Um, we're gonna start with the writing. <laughs> so um, all social media content that's effective, I think you can break it all down to something that had been well-written from the start, even if it's a video or a reel or um, a, uh TikTok, anything it all comes down to having that vision that comes with good writing and so these are some best practices that we we often share um across campus is that you just want to use whatever you can whatever you can to your advantage um or as andy would say when advantageous of course um so keeping things simple trying to eliminate as many unnecessary words as possible um, we all know that attention spans are short, and so that can only help improve your content. And I even encourage people to take an exercise of going back into something that they've posted previously and just going through the motion of figuring out maybe what you could have removed to make that message even shorter while still conveying your point. Um, there are so many articles online about social media writing, and a big thing that always comes up is asking questions. Instead of just stating something, asking a question to get your audience engaged. And I have to even constantly remind myself this of when creating content for you and all these social media is that when you ask the question, it really kind of invites people in um, and changes their mindset a little bit versus when you're just telling them something. So even as I've been writing like posts for years now, going back to these basic writing practices can really um, make a big difference. Use formatting to make points. This is when I, the example I give for this often is on Twitter and Instagram. Now you can add extra spaces between sentences or paragraphs to really kind of break up the content. When that was first gaining popularity, it was really interesting to see on Twitter, like how long you could make a tweet because then it would just take up everybody's real estate and they would kind of have to look at your content. Um, I always recommend people to use that strategy sparingly, maybe when you only have really important information to share. Um, but the formatting within social media platforms can sometimes really give you an advantage and can really help your writing if you if you use it when advantageous. Um, emphasizing with emojis. So I think student organizations, you guys are probably well versed in the emoji world. This is advice that we often have to remind colleges and departments that it's okay to use emojis and it's even inspected on social media. And the last two points, mix up your timing. Uh, I'm gonna go into a slide later that talks about some studies about when are the best times to post on social media and then using the algorithm to your advantage. So 
I think we all know, and again, what's really great about young generations of social media users is that you grew up understanding the algorithm, the algorithm is there to feed you the content that you're looking for. And so as a social media manager, knowing what can be popular in an algorithm can again, get you a long way. And then using these best practices for writing can help just make all of that work to your advantage when posting content and trying to reach your audience. Hey Katie, we had a question come out. You might Yay. get to this a little bit, but I figured I'd pop in while you had a little break between uh, slides. Um, a question came in, if you use Hootsuite to manage your social media, do you recommend it or are there other social media managers that are free that you're recommending? I don't know if this is a part of your conversation or not, but figured I'd jump in with that one. That's a great question. Um, I don't use Hootsuite for social media management. It is, they do, or they used to have a free version that can help you schedule content. And it's especially helpful if you're scheduling content on multiple platforms um and i think they used to have some free monitoring tools so hootsuite i think is a really great resource for social media studies um when it comes to scheduling tools i use a tool called buffer which is a little bit simpler it's just a basic social media scheduling they have a little um browser extension that you can use to easily share articles and things like that which we share a lot of um, so Buffer is what our office uses for social media scheduling, but I do have a slide at the end that talks about some of those free tools that you can use. That's a good question. Um, so Hootsuite is a really popular social media management platform. So is Sprout Social, um, which is, again, it's a scheduling tool that also offers some social media monitoring, which is basically like a search function where you can see what people are saying about you or your brand. Um, both Sprout and Hootsuite have some great resources and are kind of some of the industry staples for these studies. Um, and so on the screen right now is a study that Sprout Social has done about timing on social media. When are the best times to post? I always think it's interesting. We don't really, we don't always follow this. Um, because it's important to kind of experiment with what works for your own platform. Each social media platform does have built in tools that'll kind of tell you when you're posting and what the most popular times are. Um, so this is kind of from a wider study that says like Wednesdays from 10 to noon are really some of the more popular times to post. And then again on Fridays. So we do sometimes save content for Fridays because we found that on our platforms, it it often just is more popular time, um, which I always attribute that to it being kind of like the end of the week and people are looking for an escape from homework or from work or whatever it is that they do the rest of the week. Um, when it comes to these timing studies, I, I also like to talk about, there's really kind of like two strategies to um implement this information in your social media you can choose to post at these times because they're determined to be popular or you can choose to post off these times because the idea is that most people are probably posting when it's popular and your content may have a better chance of reaching some if you post in the off hours when less people are posting content so we really kind of vary um, between these. A lot of times there's just content that for one reason or another needs to go out right away. We have an event that we need to remind people of, things like that. It's just not always feasible to wait until Wednesday afternoon or Friday afternoon to post something on social media. But if you are doing a special campaign or anything like that and you do have that flexibility, it's definitely something that you can experiment with on your own platforms. So there is a little of social media etiquette when it comes to the frequency of posting on certain social media platforms. Um, this is kind of something that we um, provide again to, to some colleges and departments across campus in terms of when you're thinking about planning your content for weeks at a time, how to distribute it between certain platforms. 
think more than anything, what you should know is that you should post when you have something meaningful to say. I think there can be a lot of clutter on social media. And although it's good to know these best practices for timing and frequency, even more important than that is to make sure what you're posting is meaningful. Again, thinking about your audience, you have to do what's best for them and post that meaningful content. But again, having those best practices, um, knowing maybe some goals for how often you should post on different platforms is good to keep in mind as you're planning and setting that strategy and deciding what to post. Of course, we accessibility, um, we definitely want to cover this, especially when it comes to best practices. Um, it's so, so important, especially as a university, but I think even in your own personal social media posting to make sure that we are creating content, posting content that's accessible, um, even to people who are using assistive technology devices. So alt text, alternative text, um, which is basically text that just describes an image is an option on all major platforms now. It's usually hidden in your settings or features, and I'd be happy to provide um, specific step-by-step -step instructions to anybody who needs them, but it's just something to think about. Um, it's it's really um, an effective way to, to make sure that you're creating content for people who are using assistive technology devices. Writing a caption for a photo is, is again, like, not something that needs to be really time consuming. You just need to describe what's happening in the photo and then you can input it into um, your social media platform and then make sure that you're able to reach those people too. Captions, um, again, are easier than ever to add. I think Instagram just added auto captioning for Instagram um, TV videos, which is great. Uh, you do have to turn it on in your settings and it may not be available for all accounts yet because I think they're still rolling it out, but Facebook has it, YouTube has it. So again, it's, it's easier than ever to make sure that you have captions on your social media videos and that you can review them and make sure they're accurate. Another, um, I think until auto captioning or some captioning features are added to TikTok or Instagram stories. Until that happens, you can always kind of add a transcript of what you're saying to the story. You may have noticed people doing this already because it's become very popular with a lot of people who make videos on TikTok and stories. Um, so again, you may have seen this happen without even realizing what it's from, but I think it is kind of from that movement to make sure on social media that we're making our content as accessible as possible. Guidelines and policies. So this is just a real quick um, reminder. I think a, a lot of people who manage social media, especially for student organizations, you do a phenomenal job. Um, you, you know a lot of this already, but as you post on social media, you are there representing UNLV, your organization, and yourself. Um, along those lines, make sure that you're always crediting your sources or respecting copyrights and checking for accuracy. Um, even in my day-to-day -day job, I'm constantly like checking websites like two or three times to make sure I have days and times right, and I still like miss them sometimes. So always just a good reminder. Um, I, I really think our student organizations do a great job with social media and a little bit toward the end of the presentation, we can talk about um, we're always looking for ways in the marketing office to partner with student organizations on causes or activities that you have going on. I know things are so different now that we're in the virtual world, um, but we know that those things are still happening still virtually. And so any way that we can partner and showcase what our student organizations are doing, we're always up for having those discussions. So I'll make that plug again a little bit later. Um, but I think, again, so student organization social media is, is really great, um, really happening well here. And you guys are awesome. On that note, we had a good question just come in. Would it be a courtesy to reach out to people to make post collaborations 
or does it depend on what the post is about? That is a good question. Um, I, I think it does depend on what the post is about. So if you're using, um, if you're looking to use somebody else's content, like a photo or a video, I think that's when it's a good courtesy to reach out, send a DM or post as a comment to make sure it's okay that you repurpose something. I would, I we even do this when we use um, social media from our UNLV community is we'll always ask and make sure it's okay. And then we tell them which platform it's going to be used on or in what way it's going to be used. So in that sense, I think it's definitely a great courtesy to reach out. And it also really builds a connection between you or your organization and that person. If, um, if maybe it's already like part of a project that you've been working on, any touch point, any way that you can tell people that it's something that you plan to share on social media is something I, I recommend for sure. Did that answer the question? I think so. All right. So we'll jump into the next section. Uh, tips for creating content. Uh, just as a refresher, we've been talking about community and strategy a lot, but don't sell yourself short in that you are the expert on what your community needs. You know your audience best as the social media manager. And so it's kind of your opportunity. I, sometimes I want to say challenge, but it's an opportunity, right? to find a way to translate what your community needs into compelling social media content. And again, I always want to do a plug to make sure that you're picking the platforms that you're active on based on that community and where you can post um, the different types of content that you're looking to create. So again, asking yourself not only your goals for building a social media audience, but what your goals are with content and how are you going to measure if you're successful? Um, I talked a little bit before that, um, like success can mean a lot of different things, especially on social media. The, the statistic that we kind of jump to that I recommend jumping to is engagement, um, which isn't necessarily the amount of people who liked and interacted, but knowing who is liking and interacting with your posts and if they're part of your audience and making sure that you're reaching those people. Um, there's other ways to think about that too, just content goals. Like, did you communicate your point? Did you engage your community, give them something to think about uh, or start a conversation? There's going to be a lot of different type, types of content to post. I mentioned before, we always have like events and announcements and those day to day pieces that we have to get out. And those aren't necessarily what we're using to measure our success. It's more about that community building content. And if that's reaching our community and actually contributing to them coming together and building and having dialogue or discussions about different topics about UNLV, um, sharing their experiences, things like that. For us, that's really the true measure of a piece of social media content is if we're having those experiences being shared. And so that can be something that your organization has in mind too, as you're working on different pieces of social media content. Uh, again, another time to mention uh, marketing versus storytelling, thinking of your social media as a storytelling tool, not necessarily just a marketing tool. Um, there's this content strategist who's really popular, and I was revisiting a presentation from her recently. Her name is Anne Hand Lee. I think I have a quote from her later, so you can get the get her name if you're interested in, in looking at more of her resources. Um, but she said something that's really stuck with me over the last few weeks, and that's momentum over moments. And the idea behind that is the goal is not to just use your social media to kind of like piece by piece show different moments in time, but to use it to build momentum for the story that you're telling. 
It also kind of reminds me of in Hamilton, that, that famous lyric when he when they're like, this is not a moment, it's the movement. That can really apply to social media too, no matter what kind of content that you're creating, if it's profiles of your members, if they're educational materials, think about how you can use multiple posts posts and series to tell those stories instead of just kind of pushing it out there once and having that moment, but really building the momentum around those pieces of content, those things that really um, resonate with your audience. And I wish I could like tell you really amazing like content ideas that everybody should do, but I'm always very reluctant to do that because I think you as the experts in your audience and your community would have a better insight into what you know great ideas will make the most sense for your audiences so as you're thinking about those things oh and handily um here's another quote from her she's really been on my mind lately she was like one of the original content strategists when digital marketing really exploded quite a few years ago and um, recently has been on like the online lecture circuit. So there's her name if you wanna look her up and read any more from her, she's a great resource. But when she breaks down really good content, it's three components. It's something that has a clear use to your audience, has some kind of inspiration or creativity behind it, and then is honest. Um, I think authentic is a word that a lot of us use and it's a great word, but I think the social media world, users are becoming smarter and smarter. And so it's like pushing all of us into a new era of authenticity and honesty with our users. And so if you think of those three components when you're creating, you can make some really good or ridiculously good content. Um, all of this is really part of finding your organization's voice and evolving it. Um, as social media managers for an organization, if you can, as much as you can, I also recommend keeping track of some of the lessons that you've learned on social media. So administrators and managers far into the future can kind of take those insights and help evolve what you're doing on those platforms. Um, user generated content I have is a separate bullet here. We did talk about it a little bit before, before and asking, thanks to that awesome question, um, asking people using, uh, asking people if you can use their content. But again, this is a really great way to build your communities because people want to be part of what's happening on social media. So taking the time to look at hashtags or things that are tagged from your account or in your circles to find other content that you can share can be a really great staple of your social media strategy. Um, again, thinking about all of the different things that can go on social media, managers have to kind of have a foundation in so many areas now, photos, videos, graphic design, writing, storytelling, it can seem really overwhelming, but if you don't have strengths in some of those areas, at least know some basics, and then you'll be better equipped to work with people who are experts in those areas. I always advise um, if you're managing social media as part of an organization or a unit on campus, it's such a great, you know, thinking into the future, it's such a great resume builder and not thinking about just the social media posts, but all of the things that go along with social media, videos and photos, you're really growing your skill set in some of those areas, which may be my final push that if your organization is on social media, um, it's really just overall a great learning opportunity to build those skills that you'll need in your future too. So something to think about there. So I, I mentioned before, our office is, of course, always looking for ways to partner with organizations and units on campus to tell the UNLV story and to show what's going on even, and more especially probably in this virtual world. So there are always going to be UNLV campaigns that you can participate in. Um, a lot of those are at different times throughout the year, whether it's back to school or commencement or homecoming. Um, again, we, we're always happy to partner with student organizations. I'm sure as the next um, 
semester is starting like in a couple of months, isn't it? It's hard because time doesn't mean anything anymore. I don't think <laughs> um, starting the semester off is really a time where we on UNLV social media want to showcase all the things that students can get involved with. So we're always looking for partnerships there, and that can be a really great way to get started on some content that you're looking to add to your social media platform too. Um, if you're a student organization that's part of a national group, a lot of times there's weeks of uh, awareness around different topics. There's resources and messaging with like the national branch of your organization. That can be a really um, important part of your strategy. So it's something to always check in about and I think uh, this may go even to the question we had before, but teaming up with other organizations at UNLV or even counterpart organizations at other universities are ways that you can get more involved in the social media world and expand your audience and find more people to talk to. So our last bit here, um, I want to talk about some other social media resources. As much as I would be happy to talk, probably week after week, we could think of a new social media topic. Um, I wanted to showcase some of the resources that I often pull from to just stay up to date on social media. And some of these are um, just free tools that you can use when creating content. So for photo editing, the most popular apps that I use are called Quick Shot and InShot. Um, they can help help you make um, just like tiny adjustments to your photos that will make things pop a little bit more. Um, they kind of have some fun different settings to play around with too. We don't always use them. We got feedback a couple of years ago. It's always stuck with me. Um, and I would be very interested if anybody has different feedback on this that um, on our Instagram, people wanted really classic images with like not a lot of editing. And so ever since hearing that, I try really hard to keep that aesthetic on our page. Um, so all of these tools have some fun little features that you can play around with. Um, I encourage you to check them out, but then think about what makes sense for your group to implement. Um, I think I think there there's can be some cool stuff in there that you may be able to use. Um, Mojo is this nifty little video editing platform that you can use um, to build more animated stories. Uh, scheduling tools, Buffer is what I use. They do have a free version available for a limited number of social media platforms. So if you're sharing, especially if you share a lot of articles, something to look into. Blogs and newsletters, um, the ones mentioned here, Buffer, Sprout, and Terminal 4 are pretty popular in the higher education world as always having really up-to-date statistics and numbers and other information on social media. Uh, on Instagram, Jasmine Starr, she's like a former wedding photographer that now owns a social curator business. And she's great with tips and like little things that you can do to improve your Instagram and other social media platforms. Um, I think Harvard Business Review is a pretty staple resource um, for anyone really, not just in higher ed. And they have good content on their Instagram. Again, they're like quick little tips that you can incorporate here and there. And then I listed some TikTok accounts that are mostly um, ways to kind of do different things that you may not have thought about on Instagram stories um, or with like iPhone photography. So it's really, really fun to just see all the creative things that people are doing out there and can maybe inspire content that you're creating as well. That brings me to the end of the presentation today, but happy to answer any other questions that people may have, or if if maybe even like discussion on your organization's social media accounts, whatever it is you want to talk about. Okay, so um, I want to make sure people have an opportunity to add some uh, questions to the chat. I'm going to add one more time. I had someone just send me a question asking if they'd have access to the PowerPoint. So I'm going to put. I have a Bitly um with the pdf of these uh slides uh feel free to access them there um but i actually had a couple of questions for you come up while we were uh while you were chatting like i said we'll wait, wait to see if any other questions come in 
Um, I'm interested to hear from you in this virtual world and thing every like we're all living in this new world and we're kind of just getting used to it. I hate the word new normal, but like that's a thing. So I'm interested to know how have you seen content change um, or the way that we interact with our followers change or has it changed, you know, since the pandemic started? Mm. That is a really good question. Um, well, it's a really good series of questions. So I do think, ooh, there's a lot to unpack there. So I do think the way both people are interacting with content and how brands and content creators are posting content has changed. I think a lot of that is due to the fact that just because we're at home, everybody is just spending more time on social media. I also think it's not just because of the pandemic, but because the next generation of social media users are so savvy and they really think and kind of push brands to be better on social media, that that's created this really interesting intersection of, of a changing social media world. So I do think a lot of things are changing because of the pandemic, because we're in this new virtual world. But I don't think, I think this probably would have happened without the pandemic, but it probably would have just taken longer. I think this is ultimately where we were going is that um, we're in a world of more, I don't know what the right word is. Obviously we're more connected, but brands have to be more human to make those connections and that can be really hard for a university that also has to think of like political considerations and all of these other things that happen behind the scenes but because of the activity of our users pushing us to get there i think is overall a really great thing even though there's some stumbling blocks along the way so yes things are changing for multiple reasons did I get all of the questions? Yeah, no, I think that's really good because we got another question come in while you were answering that. That's very related. Um, Logan asked, during this time, it's been hard to find new things to post about. How do you prevent social media posts from becoming repetitive if you're trying to promote similar events? I know a lot of student orgs are doing just like, well, we're having our Zoom meetings every week and like it's kind of the same every week. How do I make that continue to be interesting or unique or um mm -hmm. engaging when it's sort of like well i don't know how to create new kind you know we're not getting together so there's not new photos there's not like that that's that's i think a challenge a lot of our student orgs are seeing i know our department's mm -hmm. seeing it mm -hmm. yeah um that's a good question so so it's hard and i think there's a lot of fatigue like people are it's hard to like sit on a lot of video calls day after day um I think the first direction I would have you consider is, I, I don't really know what necessarily, if there's any like directives that student orgs have to host a certain amount of events or things like that, or maybe it's something more internal and goals that you're trying to achieve. Um, but trying to do those, maybe what would be a virtual events in a little bit different way on social media, like if you're on Instagram, um, using some of their features like the the q a sticker or the live instagrams might be one small way that you can i think student orgs are already pretty active on instagram live i'm like thinking as i say this so you guys already got that covered but transitioning some of that content that might be in a video call to live on social media could be one way to get past that um so that's the first place I would start. If you're doing like a Zoom event on a certain topic that's maybe meant to be a discussion or maybe it's meant to be like an educational piece um, with the guest speaker, you could always invite them to do a takeover again, like a Q&A type takeover on Instagram or any other social media platform. Sometimes I think it's a matter of just getting that content that would be in a call and then putting it somewhere else. Does that make sense? What was, can you repeat the question? Let me see if I 
covered oh, everything. Oh, it's just about avoiding becoming repetitive with kind of us having yeah. the same content. You know, it's hard. It, it's hard to create new content when we're not getting together. Mm-hmm. Um, I know for us, like I don't. We've used a lot of our stock photos from old events, yeah. but you know, you don't want to look like you're having events by using old photos. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like a weird thing. You know, it's hard to create new content. I think. Mm-hmm. It is. And I think that's why, like, I think we're even seeing on Instagram, I'll just see, I bet there's going to be a study on this, but there's, they always do like studies on the content that's being shared. And so then you can figure out like, you know, 60% of Instagram content was photos versus videos versus reels. I think we're going to start to see that a big change on Instagram is there's just more graphics. Um, because that's really the way around if you don't really have a photo or if you've already used a photo. Um, the two photo editing apps I mentioned can also help you incorporate text into photos. And I think that's just kind of like the natural transition. Um, for us, we always have a really hard time with graphics on social media. They just don't always engage well. And so we're in kind of like the same struggle is like we don't always have new photos with everyone being at home so it's a matter of kind of reaching out to our audiences and asking like can you send us a video or a photo so at least we have something with faces instead of like our typical campus photo um it's like changing the idea for UNLV on our platforms, it's really kind of like changing the idea of what UNLV looks like is it's not just the campus anymore. It's our individual people and where they are representing the university. Yeah, I've seen a lot of student orgs be successful in trying to take the time to do like spotlights on their executive board or mm-hmm. you know those sorts of things. We had another question come yeah. in that I, it's two questions Paula's asking. Um, for Instagram, do you think it is better to vary colors or to stick to a certain aesthetic of colors? Um, and then also they're asking what your advice is about just generally earning more likes and followers. Um, yes, that first question about varying colors or sticking with the same color. I spend way more time thinking about that than anyone ever needs to, I bet. I I don't know why, and I think it's because well, a personal reason is because I um, used to have, this is really random, but it's how I get there. I used to have an Android phone. Like when Instagram was first, when Instagram first came out, it was only for iPhone users. And I had for like two years an Android, so I couldn't be on Instagram. And I was so like, when I get there, it's going to be the best Instagram ever, just for me personally. And, And so I think that's really impacted how I feel about the Instagram feed, even though I think most studies um, and resources now say that like the feed aesthetic does not really matter, especially if your audience is high school students or college students. It's just, it's really something that social media is getting away from. Like perfectly crafted feeds are just not really a priority anymore. People want things more real. So while I would tell you that I cannot get away from the aesthetic idea, just for me, I I don't think it really matters. I think you can experiment and have fun and not worry about everything matching. But if you're like me, kind of old, and saw the evolution of Instagram, it's hard to like let it go. It's just hard. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, I think there's some good, like, I know a lot of our, we use it a lot, and a lot of our student groups use Canva, so you can kind of create, mm-hmm. like, templates that match, and um, that's, if student orgs aren't using yeah. that, um, that's a really great tool. Um, I know we're coming close to the end of our time, so I just want to take a quick minute to say thank you so much, Katie. This was awesome. I think, one, I think the student orgs are so sick of hearing from me, because I do so many of these, um, but two, like, I just think, hearing from someone who's so entrenched in social media, not just in what you post every day, but looking at data and figuring out trends, I hope was helpful. I know it was for me. I took a few ideas. I jotted down a few resources for myself and for our page. Um, And I'm going to give a couple free plugs. Um, So uh, if anyone isn't already following um, our office on Instagram uh, or Facebook or Twitter, I'm going to put our handle it's at involvement UNLV 
in there. Um, feel free to follow us. Um, and then the one thing, one of the reasons I want to encourage you is we did this in the fall and we're going to do it again in the spring is our virtual involvement fair. So involvement fair, particularly with uh, the way things are looking in cases in Nevada, we're not going to return to an in-person involvement fair the way it has anyway looked um, in, in previous years. So we're going to go back to doing another virtual involvement fair. We've taken some of the feedback that orgs that uh, participated in the fall gave us. And it's going to look very similar to what it was in the spring and we're making a few adjustments. One of those is actually we're going to extend it to two days. We had such a great uh, response and turnout um, that we are going to extend it and uh, take two days to highlight our student organizations on campus. So all of our student org leaders, please make sure that you're paying attention to your emails. Um, in the next couple of weeks, you'll get emails about how to participate when registration starts, um, what it's going to look like, which day is going to be appropriate for your organization. It's going to be based on the type of organization that you have. Um, and so uh, it is primarily going to be, again, through our social media, our at involvement UNLV handle. So if you're already following us, um, you'll be able to follow our content. And I'm always so uh, grateful that Katie is such a good partner um, using the UNLV account to help us promote big events like that. Um, so we're right coming up to the end of the time. Is there anything else you want to say before we uh, sign off for everyone? Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I, my email is in the PowerPoint, um, but you can also really get a hold of me by messaging UNLV on any platform or social media at unlv.edu. But we're always happy to help out and share resources and find ways to partner with student orgs. So don't hesitate to reach out if we can help with anything. Same goes for us. I put our email in the chat as well, involvement at unlv.edu. Anything we can help, whether Social media, not anything related to your student organization. That's what our office is here for. So, Katie, thank you again. I'm so appreciative. This was awesome. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.